I just want to introduce our, our guest tonight. First, we have Jennifer Hyman, a recent graduate of Turo Law Center, plans to become a housing lawyer, formerly homeless. Jennifer has a passion for housing activism. She has worked with Picture of the Homeless, uh, the Committee for Independent Community Action, and the Green Party. She's currently working on landlord-tenant mediation through a clinic at school. And then we have Tom Hildegardner, a graduate of uh, Jamaica High School, received his BA in poly science at Stony Brook. Tom, like Jennifer, graduated from Toro Law, Law School. He is a Fanny Lichtstein public interest law, uh, law fellow. He interned for the Alaska Legal Service Corps, uh, where he worked as a, a native sustenance uh, rights and logging reform in the was a Tagus National Forest. Also was written on oil waste discharges from the offshore drilling platforms and uh, Cook Inlet and the Bering Sea. Uh, he began uh, tenant law, law back in 1994 and was the principal drafter of the A7928 bill that's being sponsored by Linda Rosenthal. And then we have uh, Michael Sussman, a graduate of Harvard Law School. Michael has been fighting for social and, and individual justice for more than 35 years. He is well known as one of the top trial lawyers in the region. As an assistant general counsel for the AAACP national office, uh, he litigated a full docket of civil rights cases across the U.S. on behalf of the National Office of the NAACP. In May of 81, he served as lead counsel for the Yonkers branch of NAACP and with a class of approximately 40,000 individuals in a successful, in a su successful school and housing segregation suit against the city of Yonkers. Mr. Sussman was also a Green Party candidate for Attorney General. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, tonight we are here to discuss the NYCHA blueprint plan and the bills that are currently in the committee in Albany. I do not think that many people that are affected are fully aware of the changes that may occur and that is basically the reason we're here tonight. All right, now, now we're ready to, to start again. Okay, here we go. We're going to share. So as you can see, this is a broad group that spans the city. And why are we here? Because the needs are so great. Because for too long, I'm going to say it, for too damn long, <laughs> public housing has been neglected left to get worse, and we're not going to stand for it anymore. We're not going to stand for lead in the bodies of our children. We're not going to stand for toxic mold in the lungs of our friends and neighbors. We're not going to stand for leaky roofs and dilapidated playgrounds and non-working elevators and unsafe environments and polluting and expensive boilers and heating systems. We're not going to stand for any of that. The list goes on and on. Okay. Well, with that in mind, my first <coughs> question would be, why are we uh, proceeding with a bill in Albany if this is occurring? Who wants to take that? Tom? Can't hear him. You're muted. Unmute yourself. No, I'm not. I'm not muted. Right. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's. I think you hit the the nail on the head with the question. Uh, if the Democrats control the presidency, the Senate, and the House of Representatives, and they can appropriate the funding for sufficient Section Nine, uh, for the Section Nine funding that's obviously called for and needed, what's with all these games with Rad Pat? What's with all these alternative fundings? It always seemed to me that the voucher has more appeal in certain states. I think it's a racial issue. 
that the the vouchers are can be used more readily in uh, in red states than they can in the urban areas where there's a, already a huge investment in public housing, and uh, and and Section Nine money is needed desperately. Why don't these people who are saying they're going to solve the problem just appropriate the funds? We've seen trillions appropriated in the last two years. Right. Uh, Michael, do you have anything to follow up on that? Well, <clears throat> the real politics, I think, are that... Steamship passing, steamship ferry passing, as I hear it. Um, I think the real politics of this are that while Tom is right that numerically the Democrats have a majority in the United States Senate, that majority is razor thin. Individuals who comprise that majority, particularly from West Virginia and Arizona, are dinos, uh, not rhinos, but they're dinos, so that their votes can certainly not be counted on for major appropriations for public housing. The president has a now $1.6 trillion infrastructure bill, which is best I can understand. It does not include funding for public housing, although one might argue that it's part of our national infrastructure. So that I think that Democrats in New York State, including some of our allegedly most progressive people, State Senator Jackson, State Senator Lou, State Senator Salazar, Savino, Stavitsky, some of these individuals have long, allegedly progressive records. I think that they see that there needs to be a backup. The problem is that their backup works, as I read the legislation, 6999 Assembly Bill, as introduced into the Senate, a rather significant, if almost unrecognized, change in the tenure of housing for public housing denizens. So that rather than have Section 9 housing, although the bill, if you read the bill, it seems to suggest the maintenance of the tenure for residents and tenants, it in fact converts the tenancies to what amount to Section 8, not Section 9 units. That's how I read the legislation, at least. Right. So, you know, one wonders why that simple conversion, which, which has great ramifications, is being forwarded by this legislation. I'm not against the state stepping up to the plate where the federal government is ineffective, as it certainly has been in this area for generations, and providing significant funding, whether through the capital markets or otherwise. But as a condition for that, the tenure of the tenancy should not be diminished and the target population served in those tenancies should not be diluted. My, my fear is, uh, can, can the, you know, the, if they're going to be switching the apartments from section nine to section eight, can those uh, safeties be grandfathered into the state legislator, legislation? Well, I don't see any legal reason why the legislation could not be amended, as I suggest, and delete the references to conversion to Section 8. I don't see any legal necessity for that conversion as a predicate or precondition for the type of program that they otherwise are sponsoring. So they don't, don't need to do that to create this trust, you're saying? I don't believe they do. In fact, the language in the legislation is very two-faced, the way I read it. It makes many representations that they want to protect the tenancies of all of those there, including the low, very low income denizens. But I don't the believe the Section is. 8, I don't believe the Section 8 program contemplates reaching residents at those income levels. Yes, That's the my problem concern. is when you convert from the Section 9 
public housing, traditional public housing that we've had to section eight, we might lose some of those lease protections that tenants typically rely on. So we might see more evictions. And that's what I'm particularly concerned about myself as a woman who has close ties to NYCHA personally, I say, we have to we have to fight back against blueprint to stop to stop potential eviction. Well, the the document itself says that they would be the continuation of all protections, but the conversion in and of itself suggests to me, because I don't see any other explanation for it, a desire to fence out some of those who now can't af afford, if you will, public housing because the, the Section 8 program was designed and we used it extensively in Yonkers to complement new construction of public housing for a, a, a slightly different income ranges. But it contemplates the Section 8 higher levels of income than those that are eligible for Section 9 housing. That's right. And, and, and the agenda is to get really private funds into public housing. The, that's that's the mission. Um, whereas traditionally it had been fully publicly funded. It's just we don't want to lose that lease protection that we've had with Section Nine. Uh, that's why we say no to Blueprint. One other the other thing. aspect which Tom brought up, and Tom may want to comment on additionally, but but I did submit comments to NYCHA about six months ago regarding this specific point. The RAD conversions in New York City included new, new leases for tenants. And a comparison of the new and old leases, which I did, led to the conclusion that there was, as you point out, Jennifer, significant deviations to the detriment of tenants in the new leases which people were expected to sign. I, I went through the leases in detail and pointed out those various deviations and the disadvantages they imposed. Sometimes they, 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 they overlook the, they, they violate the implied warranty of habitability, for example. Isn't that yeah. correct, Michael? They also make it easier for evictions to occur. They provide less due process. And they, there are a number of things that we, we outlined in our letter. And what I found interesting is nobody responded to the letter. I sent it to a number of individuals, you know, at, at basically making the argument if they're going to make the conversions, they should not disadvantage the tenants. At the same time, they're saying they're not disadvantaging the tenants, which is what they like to do. <laughs> I, I think that the um, the rad pack conversion. You know, I, there's a uh, there's a press release. Uh, uh, State Senator Kavanaugh issued a press release when this legislation was handed down, and one of the items in the press release is that um, this is going to prevent rad pack conversions. Now, I don't see that in the legislation. I don't see that promise in the legislation. I see in the legislation some language that leaves open the possibility that there will be rad pack conversions. Um, no, even after these properties are leased to the trust long term. Uh, so, and I haven't done the review that you have. Um, I'm, I'm late to the game here. I've only been looking at this for a short time. Yeah. Uh, but I have looked at this uh, a little bit more closely with regard to the lead-based paint issue and the mold remediation issue. And in my opinion, really, is, is that one of the purposes of accelerating rad pack conversion and perhaps moving this legislation as well, which doesn't vocally say we're not going to let that happen, is that it's going to get NYCHA out from under certain obligations that it's got to meet with regard to mold remediation, uh, with regard to lead-based paint. The, the part subpart M of the federal regulations with regard to Section 8 vouchers is much more lenient than the subpart L regulations applicable to public housing for lead-based paint remediation. And Tom, can I mention that there are there's there's people who have had real experiences with this. Excuse me, I don't know if we are live any longer, but um, there are people who've had very real experiences with this at Ocean Bay, for example, where there were promises that the units would be renovated 
Um, there were evictions. Um, there were renovations, but not not all of the units were were put into the state in which they they had been they had the state in which they had been promised. So here are some examples of what I think are problematic formulations in this new legislation. I'm looking at section 607. The protections afforded to a resident of a housing facility shall be consistent with those afforded to a public housing resident. Now, you know, everybody who writes legislation knows that each word matters. The word shall be consistent with is different than the word shall be identical to. So the, the court, if I were a judge and I was looking at that language, I would immediately wonder what does it mean to say shall be consistent with? Why doesn't it say shall be identical to? And if someone argued to me, well, it's not identical to, as a judge, I would say, well, the legislation doesn't say identical to. It says consistent with. What does exactly that mean? So, you know, if I were sitting in the room with the draft of the legislation, I'd say to them, if you mean what, you know, you say publicly, because as you point out, that is the public rap, then why aren't you using language which says that explicitly? Don't leave wiggle room, which could allow the next developer, so to speak, or owner or this, this preservation authority, or whatever it's going to be called, to say, well, this is consistent enough. <laughs> exactly. The Kavanaugh press release goes on and says that the uh, the fe that the um, that uh, NYCHA's obligations aren't going to change with regard to any judicial obligations, federal settlement agreements. And then, when you review the legislation, the only place there's any mention of that is in the legislative findings, where they do mention that. The Baez case is going Not to be is, go, is going to be is going to be somewhat guiding them. But you go down into the body of the legislation and look for the implementation clause, and it's not there. Oh, you're gonna have to rely now, you know, lawyers know that legislation is supposed to be construed in accordance with legislative intent. So it's good the legislative intent's there, but I always like the teeth too. Where are the teeth in that? Yeah, this is section 601. It is the understanding and intention of the legislature that any building transferred to this new public entity and operated by the New York City Housing Authority shall continue to be subject to the obligations imposed by Baez for the New York City Housing Authority. So it does state that explicitly. Right. Right. But, you know, in yeah. terms of when you go into the where I'd like to see something in 607 about that, wouldn't you? Yes. And, you know, Jennifer, to the point you were making in 607, there's this language. And, and I'd love to hear your, your understanding because I read this language over and again, and I can't figure my life of me understand what it even means. Here's what it says. Oh. Yes. These protections shall include, but are not limited to, providing a resident of such housing facility the opportunity to establish and operate a council to represent residents in such housing facility, to address concerns relating to such facility, and to be eligible for resident participation funding from the trust consistent with funding to available to residents of public housing pursuant to section 964.150. So that well, means- Well, that's 214B, the right to counsel right there, isn't it? Not operate a council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L, -C -O not council, C-O-U-N-S-E-L. It has nothing to do with legal counsel. Oh, it's, excuse it's, me, yeah. excuse me. No, it's okay. It seems to, it's confusing. The opportunity to establish and operate a council. So every resident, the way this reads, has the op to that opportunity, which frankly is an awkward formulation. Um, at least I think it's an awkward formulation. Absolutely is. I mean, the equivocation is unnecessary. He says, providing a resident of a housing facility automatic renewal of such residents' lease leases. Very strange. Each resident has one lease, not more than one lease. 
except for good cause as specified in the lease between such resident and the trust, consistent with the requirements relating to a lease between the public housing agency and tenant of the dwelling unit. So again, they're using this language consistent with, not identical to. I'm not sure if they understand the difference or if they appreciate it, but again, it provides more wiggle room than it, than it should be. One thing I wanted to bring up before I forget is that some of the estimates of the population of NYCHA, uh, I know the city keeps referring to 400,000, but the sanitation department estimated that based on the uh, trash that they pick up, they're estimating 600,000, which <laughs> would mean that there are 200,000 people in addition to those on the lease. Uh, Absolutely. So what it happens to those? Happen. What happens to those people once they they convert? These happen. There, there have to be there. These have there have to be lease protections. Uh, okay, so you have to get them on the lease. You need to get them succession rights. Now, I'm 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 really sorry to say, anecdotally speaking, people are doubled up in apartments where they're not legally on the lease. However, that is their abode. Um, they, would, they would qualify as being homeless, technically, because they do not have a, a, a residence. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a roof over their head. The, the, this is a precarious situation uh, for a person to find themselves in. It's, it's, it's outrageous. Um, no one should be at such risk. Of, of, of losing uh, a, a, an, an adequate dwelling. So yes, we need more lease protection. We need to prevent eviction and blueprint is not the way to go. The other part of this that I find troubling, we pointed this out again about six months ago, is there's really no tenant participation of any significant nature in either determining how funds will be used, monitoring how funds are used, participating in the process really of, of which could be a tool for economic development and empowerment for people of these huge amounts of money. And I believe there should be a, a much more decentralized focus here. The people who know the buildings should be asked and really given a very significant role in determining how monies at those buildings are to be utilized. And I don't see any provisions for that kind of inclusionary planning and participation here, which well, disappoints me. We have me. here in uh, New York City, especially with uh, the organization that I've worked with, the, the, uh, the Committee for Independent Community Action, uh, SICA, about resident management corporations. Right. Uh, putting, putting management uh, responsibilities into the hands of the tenants who reside there. Um, yes, Michael, now addressing you're just that. that concern. I think that's really totally, and, and it, it, it's unfortunate that, as I said earlier, some of the more progressive members of our state legislature, or state senate, and, you know, you talk about the Democrats controlling Washington. They have far greater control in Albany, far, far greater. And if this is the best that can come out of that group of people on the issue you just mentioned, and we just discussed tenant really directing and management. And I think there's a very strong argument for that. Yes. And the argument is that we've tried this top down management approach now for 90 years. Public housing has existed for 90 years, and it's failed in many regards the needs of tenants. Um, and I think it's a, when you talk about race, somebody mentioned race before. And I think one of the, the issues about you talk about reparations and, yeah. and the idea of giving individuals who've been the most disenfranchised in our society some real stake in the society and, and al in allowing them, enabling them to have greater institutional control. This is, the, in a way, the perfect opportunity for that. You have a failure. You know, for, 
decades. I, I, I thank you. And it's so important to put like a color on that because uh, a lot of the, the, the issue here with public housing is that it's majority people of color, people who are African-American, uh, members of the Latinx community, um, historically uh, concentrated into public housing projects, even though that was not the design for them. The design was for, uh, you know, for white middle class families. But of course, we had we had segregationist policies. Um, we had segregationist policies at the local, state, and federal level um, that created these these suburban zones and where there was flight out of the cities. And, um, and, and, and that was not just a matter of taste, that was, that was public policy. And uh, that has created this, this, this situation we're in now where we have concentrated urban black poverty and we have to address that in, in multifaceted ways. Right. It's the government's responsibility to create a, an environment for people to live. And I've talked to people and, you know, they've said to me, there is no other place for us to live. This is it. So if these people are going to remain in New York City, then we have to supply them with a decent place to live. And uh, my, my comments are, all three levels of government have failed these people. And the community, Michael was right, the communities where these facilities sit should be helping each of the community, each of the, uh, the projects to survive and we need more community involvement. Absolutely. Well, I think it's really beyond involvement. I do think that this is a, and, and this is why I say this is an opportunity. This legislation transfers control to another entity than NYCHA. And as, as we all know, it calls that entity the New York City Public Housing Preservation Trust. And it, it creates a board for that trust, which predictably will be a white dominated board looking at who's going to appoint members. Right. And it will, it, will, it will continue to reflect a kind of imperialism, if you will, and domination. And I think that what I'm trying to say is the history that it reflects, these years of neglect, which the legislative history mentions, I think that that neglect is in part the result of management that's external to the buildings, that doesn't really have a stake in living in these buildings. And, and it doesn't, I mean, you could say it doesn't really matter so much to those people how the buildings are. It matters to the people like Jennifer who's staying who live there. So I feel like there needs to be a mechanism here if there's going to be this kind of public investment to entrust the people who live in the buildings with the ability to really direct the resources. I, you know, and, and I think that would energize the community, if you will. It would bring the community together. It would provide likelihood of greater employment training and opportunities and doing the work that needs to be done at these buildings. That's the other part of this that I think is a lost opportunity. I think we need to include in measures like this major job training focus so that people who are underemployed, who lack skills, who've gone through schools in a way that's devalued them can in fact learn if they wish skills which are marketable in, in renovating and restoring their own community. I don't see anything like that here. It I, certainly think, I think it's uncreative. Yeah. Sorry. You know, go ahead. Uh, it, it certainly seems yeah, ridiculous. I, I was reading the other night, I pulled out public housing law section 401, which was the creation of NYCHA. And if you read the legislative findings for why they were creating NYCHA, they're almost identical legislative findings to what you've got right here. The same problems are coming back it's all about man. They're, they're incredibly, and to some extent, there's a culture going on in NYCHA and management there with regard to their inability. They, they come out and say it. I was involved in some um, very unusual NYCHA. NYCHA owned, uh, back in 1960s, a bunch of single family houses, mostly in Queens, went into foreclosure. HUD took title to them, and they turned them over to NYCHA to manage. NYCHA 
was in, has has flat out told me to my face, oh, we're incapable of managing those single family houses. They're scatter site. We're not developed for that. We do developments. We don't know how to do this. Well, now we see that they don't do developments either. But there's a management problem. And well, creating another level of bureaucracy and saying, hey, you know, you've got, we're, we're just going to throw another board together with a bunch of white people in charge running it and give this guy well, another extra person a six-figure salary and everything's going to be solved. There is a successful alternative. There is a successful alternative. We've seen it play out in history as well. Successful tenant management. I will read for you that an example of successful tenant management uh, took place in Chicago um, when at uh, 1230, the Nor North Burling Street Cabrini Green Building, the tenants declared, we the residents of 1230 North Burling Resident Management Corporation will provide management programs and services, social, educational, cultural, and spiritual to better the lives and conditions of the 1230 North Burling residents, and they did so for themselves. Resident Management Corporation. So the point I think we're making, all of us seem to agree on this, this legislation lacks creativity and it lacks a resonance with the current trends of empowering and empowerment that are being manifest in our communities. You get the feeling it was very thrown, out of touch. Do you Sorry. get the feeling it was thrown together quickly? Uh, to meet a particular subject? Or... And I think a lot of work went into it, which distresses me. Really? But, but I don't think that means that much creative thought went into it. I, and I think that what we're talking about are new ways of doing things. And this is a, a very partial step in that regard. And it, it's, it, it doesn't synthesize some of the thinking which is most current in communities of color, particularly. As, as Jennifer's giving expression to those in this in this podcast. And I think that we have to be more responsive to that those lines of thinking and collaboration. And this top-down approach, which is really, this is a reflection of the top-down approach to me. You know, if we're going to raise money, we have to be sure that we're in control of the people who are going to be disseminating that money and controlling right. that money. Right. We can't let them do that. Well, you know, we've had our opportunity for, for generations with this housing, and it's gone to, you know what, I won't use the term on the air. And this is an acknowledgement, as Rad Pack conversion is an acknowledgement of that same exact phenomenon. But rather than going back to giving more, people more control, you're giving people less control. And that's what Rad Pack is doing. So I feel like we have to speak to that. And I, you know, frankly, and I've said this to Luis Flores, one of the leaders of fight back movement is that, you know, we have to get this message somehow to tenants who are either dispirited, focused during this, certainly the virus on survival and the, the impact in the minority communities we know has been much disproportionate during this period. Um, but we have to find a way to get 600,000 people, if your number is right, McCabe, more mobilized to understand what's at stake and what possible alternatives can be. You know, there was someone out there who did. Uh, her name was Lenora Fulani. Um, now, <laughs> we, we need that. I agree. Uh, since there's only nine days left in the session, what do you think uh, the chances of this getting through committee? and being voted on. Well, I sent an email to uh, Assemblyman Sibrowitz's office today. And I asked him, I got a very prompt response. I said, are any hearings scheduled? Uh, what's the timeline? And I got back a very brief response. There are no hearings scheduled and there is no timeline. <laughs> but there doesn't have, they don't have to be hearings. I know. On June 13th, 2019, religious repeal for vaccination was implemented in one day in the New York State Legislature. There exactly. Were no and all of a sudden, it was before the Assembly, before the Senate, the governor signed it the same day. And literally, there were never hearings in either body, even though it was referred to committee in January of 2019. So I don't, I don't want to make any false estimates of the possibility of this. I think the real question, quite honestly, 
is whether some of these sponsors can be moved off of the, the support for this kind of an approach. I mean, I think Jackson's a wonderful person. I work with him in Inwood in our effort to stop the city's rezoning in Inwood. He was very helpful. He was very supportive. I mean, I don't know all these people, but I think some of them are, are supposedly advocates for people that we want to represent and help. John Lewis, my state senator, exactly. and uh, and 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 he he can be a nice guy. He can be a reasonable guy sometimes. Um, I believe he own you know he's got a vast district, but I think he only has one New York City Housing Authority project in his district. He's and in yeah yeah, and he's in Queens. He's in northeastern Queens, Little Neck, Malba, Whitestone, the Blair houses over at College Point. And Roosevelt, I think, are the only NYCHA housing project in his district. Um, maybe there's one or two really small, minor ones that I'm overlooking. But I've looked at the map and gave a hard thought to that last night. And I said, you know, I think this guy represents one NYCHA housing development. And he signed on in the Senate for this. And I was thinking about that, about strategizing before schmoozing him. About, you know, John, you might want to think about uh, alternatives to this legislation before you're so quick to sign on as a co-sponsor. But I think Jennifer's right that the alternatives have to be big picture. I, I think that we have to really be thinking about fundamentally different alternatives to the resurrection, if you will, and supported resurrection of this sort of housing. I, I think that this approach is, a, a, you know, we need more money. How are we going to get more money? Which we do need more money. But that money has to be associated with fundamental changes in the way governance of these housing developments is projected, the way the money is used, the, the kinds of how opportunities, economic opportunities that will bring. I mean, there's so much that gets synthesized into this, and it's not in here, as well as obviously what we talked about initially, the tenure of those who are going to be living there. That's right. We're just talking about having a habitable dwelling and um, you would be shocked. You would be shocked. You would be remiss to see what many of these tenants are in fact going through in their units. Uh, the, the, the failure of utilities, the problem with mold, vermin. It's, it, it's, it's just, it's like a long, it's a, it's a litany of, of, of neglect issues. And um, and what what we can do to respond to this is is to to take control, um, empower the tenants to manage buildings themselves. Well, so isn't, so like isn't that what nine, part nine sixty four is about? Michael was talking about that before about that convoluted section of uh, six o seven. That talks about tenant management. That talks about that re actually expressly refers to um, the federal regulations under the Fair Housing Act, Section Part Nine Sixty Four. Is that some avenue we should perhaps be exploring? That's really where they talk about tenant involvement of the management of the project. But of course, it's this section seems only applicable to Section Nine housing it doesn't seem that it is an idea that's even on on the burner if you convert to section eight section eight housing section eight housing would would not i, I don't i don't see section eight housing having re resident management corporations along with it because it's 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 a it's a, an effort to privatize essentially we're putting there's they're subsidizing so that private Developers can make profit from uh, from these from these these units. Um, it's it's. This is a piece of legislation that uses language to try to appease some of the concerns that have been expressed, and what you're speaking about, Tom, is an instance of that where they talk about every resident has the right to form a council. C O U N C I L. Okay. But the yes. Power, yes. The power of the councils are not really enumerated in a manner which gives any self governance 
or fosters any self-governance. So, I, I mean, I think that you're right. There's some sense of, of, of involvement, but I think it has to get much deeper than that. And there has to be a focus on what that's going to look like in terms of resource allocation. For instance, there's, there's a whole process in this legislation for how the money is going to be bidded out, how you apply to use the money, the accounting yes. processes, the corporate processes, all that. that has, that's totally disconnected from the tenants. They've given great thought to that, Michael. You can tell that they gave a great deal of thought to that. That's totally mm. separate from the, you know, this, this sort of few words about preserving tenants' leases and rights and the like. And there's no association between the two. The other thing well, is, it's, it doesn't it's say. Lip service. It doesn't I mean, say, there's there's a very real concern that those those lease protections just won't be there any longer. Well, even even if the lease protections are there, give the benefit of the doubt on the lease protection issue. It's really that's and I agree that's obviously critical. You want to be able to keep people in housing, but as you pointed out, if the housing is vermin infected. If the housing has mold, if the housing has decades of unremediated lead, then you're essentially consigning people to housing, which is a death trap, even if That's not an right. immediate death trap. So the point we're driving at, I think, here is how are we going to reconstruct this system with people who have a stake in the housing, having much greater control over the funds, which can be used to remediate this whole range of toxic problems which have been allowed to uh, assimilate and accumulate over the years. Well, is the problem is the problem that uh, those who are in power are not interested in funding uh, uh, something that would be uh, amount to a resident management corporation rather than putting money into the hands of private developers? I mean, is that the issue here? Yes. <laughs> well, how much money should someone be able to make off of these buildings when the buildings are mismanaged at the level they're in. Introducing yeah. private private interests into this situation where we know from an economic point of view, it's a quote, losing proposition. We get that. Yeah. We have to make this into a winning proposition. The way to do that is both radically improving the housing, but also from my perspective, involving residents there in the plumbing, in the design of heating systems, you know, right. Involving people so that they can learn skills, which then allow them to continue not only to, to use them at those buildings, but beyond. Make it a win-win yeah. type situation. Nothing about this even begins to speak to that, which is why I say there's a paucity of creativity here. If you have an opportunity to redo this system, think about all of the ways those buildings can be utilized in a certain sense as centers for something. Training. Training, education, right. parenting, all sorts of things can be in these buildings. And rather than just see them as brick and mortar and we failed, let's get money. No. So that's my two cents. <laughs> all right. Well, I appreciate all of you coming tonight and, and uh, all agreeing, which, which was something that I wasn't sure whether we're all going to agree on things. So our focus going forward then would be to contact these political leaders and push for community uh, control from the buildings. Is that it? And a lot more, but yeah, it's a beginning. Yeah. That's to be a conversation with them about the opportunities they're foregoing. You know, it's the federal government that has the power to coin money. At the end of the day, they're the people who basically withheld the money from the Section 9 program to put people in dire straits here. Now they've been holding out this carrot and stick approach and the state assembly, the people in the states, they're like, well, you know, we've got no choice at this point. They've been, with, they've been starving us for funds on Section 9. Uh, we got to do something. People live in these buildings. We've got to provide for them, you know, their lives are going on. We can't just sit here and continue to wait and hope that the federal government is going to come in and do what they should. So I think that, yeah, the tenant, tenant uh, control is a marvelous idea. 
uh, I think we got to get on our federal legislators about coming across with the dough. Because this whole idea of like, well, we're going to float a bond that's backed by Section 8 vouchers. This is something that, that legislators have been, it's, it's the death knell of public housing. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the federal government basically getting the state governments to capitulate that, you know, we're going to kill this stuff off. And it's all going to be Section 8 based. And it's all going to be tenant based. And we're going to end federal commitment to federal housing. And I think we got to reverse that. And I think with this time is now, where as thin as the margins are, Mr. Manchin, et cetera. And I hear what you're saying, Michael, about you've read the infrastructure bill. That's something I haven't done. And you don't see any money for public housing in there. That's a crime. Uh, Senator Schumer should be asked about that. What's up with that? All right, well, in that video that I showed earlier, he was talking about doubling the number that Biden had and making it $80 billion that he was going to ask for. And then the day after, uh, Bernie and uh, AOC came out and they wanted to double that figure. So to me, that just meant it was going to be killed because there was no way Republicans would have allowed that. Yeah. So you're right. We need to get on, on the Congress uh, get get on their butt and uh, start moving this. Jennifer, you want to add something? I have said my fill because I just keep insisting on the resident management corporation as the way to go. And I'm so glad that you all have recognized that that's exactly what we need. Um, it's it's about it's about building autonomy for tenants, giving them skills giving them a dwelling, it's, it, th these things are just fundamental. The other um, thing, and, the other thing yeah. to me is that when we talk about the concept of reparations, we have many trade unions that have historically excluded people of color. And these trade unions, which have huge billion dollar pension funds and the like, need to be in these buildings, training a new generation of workers who don't look like them necessarily. And there's no better place to do that than in the buildings which need this kind of massive renovation, restoration, et cetera. And there's a, to me, there's a poetry and a symmetry and a synthesis that really works in terms of social justice here and payback and give back. It's not, you know, it's not just such a concept at a broad level. It has to be actualized. And the public housing in New York City provides a, a platform to actualize a lot of this, both in, terms right. of, both in terms of who manages these buildings henceforward and shifting control to people who are there and who are at stake, but also shifting the whole notion of who's going to be taking care of the buildings, the skills that are going to be trained for, who's doing that training. I mean, I think this could be, you know, a tremendous opportunity to have a different vision of how we go forward. And I think the problem is that the lack of creativity that, that's being manifest is indicative of the failure, and it's our failure collectively, to project the urgency of the moment, the instant need for institutions to genuinely change. And I think that has to happen here. You know, I live in a county where Newburgh is the major city in Orange County. And Newburgh is a very immiserated city. And we have an IDA, an industrial development agency. And I've proposed for 20 years that that IDA raise bond money, use the money raised to renovate the 600 vacant buildings in the city, bringing in our local labor unions to train people from the city who've been undereducated, miseducated, et cetera, because yeah. that's what's happening in our schools, thereby try to shut down that pipeline from schools to prisons, give people skill sets which are marketable, which are in, in short supply in our communities. So you have such a win-win-win type situation it's very you know, simple I, here. I, I, work, I work with people who are homeless. I have been homeless myself. And one thing that we can all see with our eyes is whenever there's vacant land, vacant property, 
that is just left to lay fallow. That could be housing for somebody. Exactly. That could be housing. It could be rehabilitated and turned into uh, a, a collectively owned property. But it's also an opportunity for much more. That's my point. I agree with you. It's housing. It has to be housing. But we also have to have to find ways of addressing those who are so marginalized in our communities and and giving giving reaching out and saying there's something concrete that and it's not one thing. We need all sorts of craftspeople. We need all sorts of, of skills. So. I just wish that those in power would see these opportunities for what they are and not be so limited and and repetitive, if you will, in their distribution of power and resources. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Again, I thank all three of you for coming tonight. Uh, I, I will distribute this video to every corner that I can and to all the legislators that I know personally, and maybe we can get something moving. Uh, Thanks for your help. It's great that you're doing this. I, well, Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, like I said earlier, I just didn't think enough people knew about what were what was happening, and they are the people who are being affected most. So. Oh, we are we are waking up in these in these buildings. Good. Yeah, but I've talked to a lot of people and none of them knew anything about this. So that's what motivated me to do to do this tonight. So thank you, Michael. All right. Take care, everybody. And, and thank, nice thank you, Michael Sussman and Tom uh, and Tom Hill Gardner. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Jennifer. Michael, I be well. Good to see you. Nice to meet both of you. Take care. Okay. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care. Good night now. Take care. Good night.